faculty here at um, Sac City College. This semester I'm teaching Chem 401 and I'm doing Chem 484 research, uh, undergrad research, and I'm also part of the Chem Tech program, which I'll talk more about in a little bit. And did you want to briefly introduce yourself, Bill? I mean, they know you, but. Sure. No. So uh, my name is Bill Miller. Uh, I'm uh, teaching Chem 400, Chem 401, the lectures and discussions, and also Chem 333, the science of coffee this semester. And then I will be teaching Chem 400, Chem 484, which is a research class, um, and Chem 333 in the spring. Uh, so, um, yeah, yes, I heard and, that. Uh, I heard that coffee to be class here. is amazing. Yeah, I've heard really good things about the coffee class. So take the coffee class. <laughs> I'm going to take the coffee class probably. <laughs> that would be awesome. That would be fun. Yeah. All right. And then the next one. Ooh. Hold on. There we go. There we go. So what research opportunities, specifically undergrad research here, do we have at SEC? Well, we have the Chem 484. That's our advanced gen chem course. It's an honors course. And that course is transferable, by the way. So you can transfer that course if you're moving on. And we also have Chem T 429, which is part of our Chem Tech program. And I teach that one. The, the general chemistry, the advanced general chemistry course, the honors course, uh, both Dr. Miller and I teach that and also Dr. Dow. I know Dr. Dow next semester is taking a little bit of a break, but then he'll be back the following semester. And then we have research parts of our lab classes as well. So in Chem 410, the quantitative analysis portion, Dr. Ochoa teaches that class. And he, he incorporates a lot of research in that class for his students. And then in Chem 400, as you see, um, there's some research opportunities there as well. Now, why do undergrad research? Well, there's lots of different reasons um, to do undergrad research, but you're really learning a lot of new skills. You're solving problems. Of course, we worry about our resumes and, you know, we want to apply to different schools. And it's a, it's also a great way to get a recommendation because we can actually write you really strong letters because we know a lot about you and your background. And it could also lead to other opportunities. And this could be an industry. And then once you transfer, we have connections as well. And then they we can help you with that. And then once you transfer, they see what you've done. And these also help with units to graduate, like I said, with the advanced honors chemistry being transferable. Um, that also helps as well, helps GPA, and it's a great way to network. Lots, lots of different reasons to do undergraduate research, and it's fun. I think fun is like the biggest deal. I think it's just really great to learn new things, be in the lab. You, It seems that like you step in the lab to do research, and three hours goes by so quick because you're just learning, and, and to me, it's really fun and exciting. Yes, no, it's a uh, good point, Tanya. It's fun for the students and it's fun for us. Yeah, uh, we love so it. Um, so in bold there, it mentions uh, REU's research experience for undergraduates. And that is another opportunity that, and uh, increasingly REU's are uh, focusing on taking students from community colleges. So these are opportunities that can be open before you transfer, if that's the direction you're going. Um, and even if it's not, it's it's still an option. And uh, what is a research experience for undergraduates? Well, it's eight to 12 weeks of full-time research over the summer. It generally pays between five and $8,000 for those eight to 12 weeks. And there are more than 100 different programs throughout the country. And what I did is I just went over to UC Davis and they have three of them there. Um, one in the Department of Chemistry called Chem Energy, REU. They have one uh, in more of the uh, ecology department called Ecological and Evolutionary Response to Rapid Environmental Change. And then they have another one in the Pure and Applied Math uh, Department, or I think it's in the Math Department, but it's about Pure and Applied Math. So even if you're not a chemistry major, uh, there are lots of different areas for REUs. There are lots of different schools. Uh, in particular, um, uh, we have sent uh, three or four students at least 
to an REU in uh, Old Dominion University, which is in Virginia, so across country. And we've got a good relationship with them, actually. And we hope to get one or two students there uh, this uh, for next summer as well. Uh, this page lists a bunch of the different areas in which there are REUs. Um, and you can search at this website for them. And they'll, you know, there are, Harvard has it, um, you know, all over the country, you know, University of Michigan, schools in Florida, schools in Arizona, wherever you want to go, there's one. Um, and uh, even in STEM education, uh, which I think is interesting as well. Now, additional benefits of undergraduate research. Um, so you conduct hands-on hypothesis-driven research. This is the scientific method, and this is how it works. Um, you work directly with faculty members and team members, and you'll be presenting your work from time to time in these um, uh, groups and potentially at conferences. Uh, gain a deeper understanding of science. Um, and yes, develop and refine your presentation skills. Uh, one of the great things about research is it is fairly independent, meaning you do it for yourself. You make progress. Uh, Based So you can make more progress or you can make less progress, depending upon uh, how much time and how much focus you put into it. And that's actually very different than classes. Like if you think about a, a Chem 400 or a Chem 401 lab, where you've got a list of things you, you know, it's a, uh, you've got to do in uh, two to four hours, and we tell you exactly what to do. Well, research is not like that, um, in a good way, I would say. Um, there uh, and uh, so it, it can, it's a great skill to have when you apply for jobs and once you're in a job, and it's great uh, preparation for graduate school, uh, which uh, Tanya and Tanya and I I would imagine are both very happy to talk about outside of this seminar about what graduate school is like and um, what the, the pros and cons of going. What is expected of you? Um, well, safety first, for research classes, you'll go through additional general safety training as well as any specific training, any safety training specific to your project. You will uh, read scientific articles. Um, more and more, actually, for one of my projects, you'll watch YouTube videos about topics too. Um, and with your research advisor, you'll formulate and conduct new experiments, uh, meaning experiments that nobody's ever done before. And uh, this is uh, where it gets a little like uh, grad school because it says you do the, the results of the experiments will lead you to do these experiments over and over again um, until you have good statistics on them, really. Um, and uh, but then eventually you'll get to do new experiments as well. And as far as class time required, well, uh, Chem 484 and Chem T 429 are I, I think I have this correct. Uh, Tanya, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's a three hour lab class. That's yeah. right. And so is 484. And then in Chem 400 and Chem 410, uh, actually, uh, I'm excited to announce for Chem 400 that there will be um, a, a three lab period undergraduate research experience next semester. So um, uh, still in the planning stages. All right. Thank you, Bill. Uh, and I now want to first talk about, I'm going to talk about the Chemtech program in general, and then I'm going to discuss my um, research that I do here. So first about the Chemtech program, I want to show a video. Can you go to the next slide? Yep. So I want to play this video because I think this um, gives a lot of good information first. Are you looking for a well-paid career in technology? Does working in a lab and can you hear that? Yeah, it's a little low on my side. All right. Let me restart. Are you looking for a well-paid career in technology? Does working in a lab environment in the cannabis, food and beverage, forensic, or environmental industries interest you? If so, the Sacramento City College Chemical Technology Program is for you. Whether you are finishing high school, are a recent high school graduate, or want to change careers. Sacramento City College's Chemtech program is the fastest, easiest, and one of the most affordable ways to begin your career as a chemical technician. Requiring some post-high school training, 
but less training than a university degree. The Chemtech program has three different certification levels to offer. A level one beginning chemical technician certificate can be earned with only one year of training, allowing eligibility to work as an entry level laboratory technician. You can earn a level two certificate to become an intermediate chemical technician after a year and a summer of training, which provides eligibility to work as a laboratory technician. A level three advanced chemical technician certificate can be earned after two years of training, which affords career opportunities as a winery analysis technician, chemical plant technician, forensic science technician, and much more. Besides providing hands-on learning and an opportunity to work with modern equipment, in a supportive school culture. We also help connect you with employers in various industries through internships. If you have already taken some chemistry courses, you may already qualify for our level one certificate. If this is the case, please get in touch with one of our coordinators listed on our website. Please be sure to check out our brochure with a lab technician's average salary of $48,000 a year. Space is limited. So please visit our website today. There we go. All right, thank you. And then you can go to the- Are you looking for- There we go. There we go, thank you, thank you, Bill. Yep, so you can see with the video, um, we have three levels of the certificates. And I just wanted to point this out for everyone because um, it gets a little bit confusing about what classes you would need to earn these certificates. And what um, we would like, you know, part of the our department here to convey is that uh, many of you are already taking Chem 400, 40, you'll be taking 401 and so on. And you'll see that you can already earn certificate two by having 400, 401. Definitely certificate one if you have 400. So if you look at pathway two for certificate one, the requirements are general chemistry, 400, and Chem T 201, which is a seminar course. It's all asynchronous online. I'll talk a little bit about more that, about that being offered. And English writing, 300. And notice it has a superscript two, and that's because we're trying to also have other English courses you may have taken um, count for that. So really with Cert 1, many folks can apply for that. Many students can do that and already get Certificate 1. And with Certificate 2, you take a couple more courses, and then you can see Cert 3. There are a couple different pathways. Many And we just changed this with the curriculum. Now you can take an organic pathway and then you can also take the or take the quantitative analysis pathway. And like the video said, we will connect you with our industry partners. So there's an opportunity to have an externship with our program to get you ready for industry. Thank you. Right for next. There you go. Yes, thanks. And if you're interested in the Chemtech program, please feel free to reach out to me. It's actually, you can click on our chemistry website as well. And there's an application there or reach out to me too. I'm happy to send you an application. And here are some of the courses that will be offered in the spring. And I said I would come back to Chem T201. Chem T201 um, is taught by Dr. Agnew and it's careers in chemical technology. It's a really cool course because it lets you see what you can do with these certificates. And like I said, it's fully online, it's asynchronous. Um, there's no exams in it, but it's just really meant to be informative to tell you about what's out there for that type of career. And then there's also Chem T424. I teach this as well as part of the Chem T program. And really what it is, is it's an instrumentation course and it's getting dark in the classroom. So it's an instrumentation <laughs> course that um, it's a really cool course because you will not only learn how to use the instruments, you learn to troubleshoot them. When we speak with our advisory board um, on our for our Chemtech program, they mention they want folks who can actually do some troubleshooting. They will run the instrument, but then, okay, well, what if something happens with that instrument and it breaks down? Can they do some basic service to that instrument? So we all, we're teaching that. So you have a lecture portion for that class, which is asynchronous. And then the lab portion. So in the lab, you learn how to run the instrument and then you learn how to do some maintenance and troubleshooting on that instrument. And then Chem T429 is what I'll be talking about next. And we also have an in-house WEXP 498 course. What that is, it's a work experience chemistry stockroom course. So you work in our chemistry department here in the stockroom with our department, our chemistry department staff. And we have a 
couple positions open at the Davis Center, and then we have um, several here as well. So being part of our program, you get that experience, and it's just like any internship that you would have outside of the um, you know, or the college here. So it's a really good opportunity. You learn lots of things, and um, you get to be part of um, that the stockroom staff there for a bit. And it's 60 hours, um, and that means a semester, and it's a one-unit class. And we are accepting applications for spring soon. So like I said, please feel free. If you're interested to um, get in touch with me, I'm happy to send you an application. All right, let's talk about uh, research projects. So for Chem T429, and I do these for Chem 484 as well, but I have three areas of interest. The first is cannabis analysis. And that's um, really analyzing for CBD and pesticides, water analysis, and beer analysis. And I'll talk about each of these. So cannabis analysis, um, I show this map because I just wanted to show that, you know, cannabis now being the regulatory uh, system now is allowing more states to have either medicinal cannabis being of use or it's fully legal for recreational use. So, you know, um, times are changing. It's not like it used to be where a lot of folks were, you know, it was all illegal everywhere. Um, it's no longer being, you know, criminalized as much as it was in the past. And so because of these changes, there wasn't a lot of research done on it before and folks uh -huh. weren't making it. Uh, making these products for folks to consume. So we need chemists and we need lab technicians to know how to deal with cannabis in a safe, regulated way. So we need a lot of accurate analytical analysis now because we're no longer, you know, because it's regulated, we want to make sure dosing limits are safe for people, for THC and for CBD. And well, what are what's going to be analyzed in cannabis? Well, there's a lot to cannabis. It's not just the THC, the psychoactive um, material that makes you high. There's also CBD, there's CBN. You can analyze it for hemp. But what else is in there? There's terpenes and pesticides. Pesticides are a real issue. Pesticides are hard to analyze. So that's um, a research interest of mine. Residues and heavy metals. Folks are consuming this. You want it to be safe for them. And the next one. So how do we analyze cannabis products? Well, we use analytical chemistry. So it's a branch of chemistry where we use instruments to separate, identify, and quantify that matter. And um, I'll talk more about that in a second. I just tried to show some cool instruments here. <laughs> and you really, again, want to ensure consumer safety. We don't want contamination. You want to optimize your ingredients in there. So the nu nutrient uptake and you want to be able to know what you're consuming. And then you want to optimize the extraction processes as well and be able to say how much is in there. Products now still aren't very consistent. So you really want to optimize the homogeneity of these products when people are consuming them. It's hard to get like a good dosage in a gummy, you know, of your THC or CBD. So cannabis is really unique. Um, contains 500 compounds not found in other plants or animals. It has a high lipid and fat content, low moisture. It's very different to deal with in other commodities. And again, um, high prevalence of terpenes. So it's a challenging matrix, which means it's, it's challenging to analyze, to extract, and to purify. And lots of products, lots and lots of products. So I deal with, um, I will have, I actually myself have grown cannabis to be high in CBD and low in THC because you can buy the seeds to do that. So I deal with the flowers. You can also have capsules with CBD. Now, CBD is a big industry. Lots of people are using it even for back pain. You have the roller. Um, I see hot things now where they have a CBD portion in there. You can have, so you can have a capsule method. You see chocolates. You see lots of different dessert items, tinctures, lotions, um, beverages, right? So they have beverages now with that in there as well. So it's, again, lots of, and all of these different types of products a gummy is very different to analyze than a tincture. So looking at the chemistry for that, is, it's very different. 
And I'm so interested in cannabis because it is such a fast growing industry. And speaking with being part of Chemtech as well, speaking, we have a cannabis uh, advisory board member. He actually has a lab that is trying to understand cannabis a lot more. And the problem with that as well is a lot of folks don't know how to deal with cannabis. So we still think it's an important area in research to educate young people to go ahead and, you know, get into that industry. I think it's, there's going to be, it, it's going to keep growing. And uh, primarily here, we're going to be using GCMS, HPLC to look at any contaminants. And I focus primarily on extraction methods, separation of, of those methods and, and uh, quantification later for, first of all, can, can I find different methods to extract them? Uh, okay, that's the first one. The second part is water analysis. Now, we all know water analysis is really important. Do we know what's in our city's water? We have lots of Americans exposed to unsafe drinking water, and it disproportionately affects uh, poor and minor minority, community, my minority communities across the U.S., so what am I doing here at Sac City? Well, right now I'm actually testing campus water. So I have some students who are not only looking at the pH, the hardness, we're testing metals and turbidity here. And so one of the instruments I show here is using AA for this analysis. And what we're doing is you get the city's water report and you can compare. You can compare what are we getting, what is the city, city saying we should get versus um, what we get here. And then beer analysis. So this is a newer research project for me. I am doing this in collaboration with Jessica Coppola. She is over at the Davis Center and she has a class and her class is about brewing beer. So how the collaboration is working is her students make the beer, give them to us, and my students are analyzing the beer. And we want to do that because commercial breweries spend a lot of money and energy into making sure beer is not oxidized. You want products that are consistent. You want your customers to be happy. When you have beer that's oxidized, it's stale, tastes like cardboard. You can see a color difference. So here we're developing methods for analysis using HPLC and GCMS as well. Thank you, Tanya. That was uh, some really interesting uh, research that you're talking about there and a lot of instrumentation heavy stuff. Um, and sort of the contrast uh, currently at least between chemtech and the kind of projects you'll do there versus chem 484 research is that uh, our uh, prerequisite is chem 400 or um, uh, the talks to the instructor to get into it and so our projects are a lot less uh, instrument intensive and so i for the spring uh, i plan on running two projects uh, project one it's called Creating Chemistry Education Materials about chirality for social media. And I don't know if anybody has ever come across this uh, meme picture of Samuel L. Jackson and Samuel D. Jackson, but it actually inspired me to, uh, to start this project. It's one of the things that inspired me to start this project. And that's because as cool as this meme is, it is wrong. <laughs> I know, Samuel, but I so, love it. It is funny. It is funny though. But and, and but and it, so the L and the D are um, uh, nomenclature or naming for different type of chiral compounds, which we'll talk about. And uh, project number two, estimating the partial molar volumes of each component in a binary non-ideal solution, um, is. Um, that project actually started with my uh, science of coffee class um, because we started using handheld refractometers with that class. And all of a sudden we found out we could do many other things. But I'll talk more about both of these projects. Uh, there we go. So um, the first one, uh, what is chirality? An object is chiral when it has a mirror image that is non-superimposable. And so left hand and right hand are perfect examples of this. And in fact, in Greek, the word chiral means hand. And it turns out that you can imagine a mirror right where my nose is 
And you can see that these are mirror images of each other, but they're not the same. And it turns out uh, that's an important that's important for molecules. Uh, down at the bottom of the slide, I show something that's achiral or not chiral, and that's a flask. And if you take a flask and uh, put it in a mirror, it, it's it's exactly the same on both sides. So something uh, things can be chiral and things can be achiral. Well, molecules can also be chiral. And the simplest example of something that is chiral is a carbon with four different atoms bonded to it. And uh, I've got uh, two models right here that are like the models all pictured on the page. And uh, hopefully you can see that they are mirror images of each other because I'm holding the purple one far away. Um, and they are non-superimposable meaning that when I try and make them the same, and I don't know if this is, it turns out you can't, let's just say that. And it wouldn't be me if I did not say, uh, this is carbon with four things attached. So it is uh, tetrahedral geometry. Uh, and uh, that's just for my students. Um, now, uh, it turns out that all amino acids are chiral and many drugs are chiral. And what I'm showing here is ibuprofen. And I'm also showing it as a skeletal structure. And it turns out that this carbon right here, which is this little dot, is the chiral carbon. It has a carbon here. It has a carbon attached to oxygen and uh, OH, uh, which is different than just having a carbon. And then this whole ring structure over here. And what's not shown uh, and what would be with a back wedge would be that there's an H attached to this as well. And, and I lost my little shape drawer there, but there's an H as well for you. So indeed, there are four different things attached to this. Uh, we don't usually show the H, but it is there. And then on the other side, we've got a mirror image. It turns out that the one on the left, this one helps to alleviate pain. Um, the one on the right does nothing. And it is very hard to separate these two things. And so when you take ibuprofen, and uh, I did today to help with my pain from my surgery, um, you're actually getting what we might say is both hands. You're getting both mirror images um, even because even though only one of them helps you alleviate pain. Anyway, lots of interesting things uh, about this. And let me see, there we go. And now what I'd like to do is I'd like to show some of the introductory videos we've made for social media and placed on social media at uh, the Instagram account at Chiral Goes Viral. This first one will be by Jason. And it shows sort of what we've already talked about, except with a bottle, chiral versus achiral. Here's another one. Let me show. And this one was in uh, made by uh, Kim, and uh, I'm going to do my best to pronounce this. Uh, it's in Tagalog, and I apologize if I did that. Uh, and because one of the things we're interested in doing is um, having uh, our media that we are making uh, be in as many languages as possible so we can educate as many people as possible. All right. Uh, two more videos. Uh, Reginald made this one. Let me go ahead and play it. Boy, am I hungry. Welcome to Atomic Burger, where our burgers are delicious. How may I help you? Well, I like uh, a mole of fries, and that'll be it. Hey, you look just like me. 
And I'm only showing a portion of that video. That video goes on to talk about uh, how those two are non superimposable mirror images. Uh, you'll have to check out at Chiral Goes Viral to see the whole video. I've got one more. Uh, so, and what we've attempted to do is put this one in Spanish uh, as well. And uh, fun fact, that music, if you could hear it, was actually made by a band that has a chemist in it. And I've met the chemist. And so that's how I got uh, uh, the okay to use that uh, music. Ooh, uh oh, there we go. Good. So that's a little bit about uh, the, that first project. And that first project in Chem 484 is able to be done um, by having meetings and producing things asynchronously and online, or not asynchronously, online and synchronously, because we still meet every week uh, as part of the Chem 484 class. The second project meets in person because it has wet chemistry involved. And it's um, uh, the title, which can be daunting, estimating the partial molar volumes of each component in a binary non-ideal solution. Well, let's start with what a non-ideal solution is. Turns out if you take 100 milliliters of 2-propanol and add 100 milliliters of water to it, you don't get 200 milliliters. And the fact that you don't get 200 milliliters makes it non-ideal, or we could also say non-additive. And um, I uh, was interested in this because Basically, a lot of hand sanitizers are just water and alcohol mixed together, and the alcohol, whether it's 2-propanol, which is also called isopropanol or rubbing alcohol, or whether it's just plain ethanol, then um, that's how they make hand sanitizers, and hand sanitizers have been big over the last few years. So that's what non-ideal means. What is the molar volume? The molar volume of a substance is the volume of one mole of that pure substance. And the way you calculate it is you take the molar mass and you divide it by the density. And doing that, we can show that the molar the molar volume, excuse me, of water is 18.07 milliliters per mole. Love my units. And then the same thing for 2-propanol is 76.97 milliliters per mole. Um, and it's, so it's it's like the molar mass. The bigger the molecule, typically, the larger the molar volume. The more volume it takes up for a mole. Now, finally, the partial molar volume. That's the molar volume when one substance is added to another. Say water, one drop or one mole, in effect, is added to a big tank full of isopropanol, for example, Instead of taking 18.07 milliliters per mole, which is what it did on the last slide, it takes significantly less. And what we do with very simple measurements is we measure these quantities and we use the refractive index to do it, which is interesting in and of itself. And the way we do that is with what's called a handheld refractometer. This is a picture of a handheld refractometer what you do is you'll place three to four drops of solution on this prism. You'll close this piece down on top of the prism, and then you'll look through this eyepiece with light shining into the prism, and the drops are right here smushed on this prism. And you'll look into this and you'll see a scale. And ND is the refractive index, and the refractive index uh, there will be a blue to light transition, and you just read the numbers at that transition. And so uh, how do we do these experiments? We basically take water and something else, 2-propanol in this case. We mix them together. We record the masses. We place the solutions on that handheld refractometer, and then we measure the refractive index as we change the amount of 2-propanol. Uh, 
And while we measure masses in the lab, we know how to convert masses into moles. And then we can do what's called a mole fraction, where zero mole fraction is pure water and one mole fraction of 2-propanol is pure 2-propanol. And what we see is we can do measurements that are the same as have already been done in literature, uh, where the green dots are our measurements and the yellow dots are literature data. So same, very close anyway. But it's very simple experiments. Take two things, mix them together, weigh how much of each one you have, and then take a measurement of it. And I will skip the details because steps two through 12, uh, there is significant calculations that we do coach you through to turn refractive indices into partial molar volumes. But when we do, we find that our data is actually fairly reasonable matching the uh, data of the dashed lines, which are the literature or correct values. And uh, that's the two projects that I'm looking to do for Chem 484. Like grad school, you usually, uh, your advisor has projects for you and you can choose which one to work. Very rarely do you go to your advisor and say, hey, I wanna do this. And then the advisor says, sure, I'll pay for you to do it in grad school. It can happen, but typically, you you go to the projects that they already have. Um, Chem 484 requirements, so completed Chem 400 or instructor approval. And in the spring, when I'm teaching it, it meets on Friday mornings in person, uh, somewhere on the third floor, I forget which lab. And I would just like to thank all of these people, uh, including Kim, who what he was here and, and maybe here. I'm not sure if Jason or uh, Reginald made it, but hopefully they did. Um, and then the partial molar volume project. Actually, chirality is new this past, this fall. The partial molar volume project has been going for about two, two and a half years now, both while I've been here at Sac City College and um, at Prince George's Community College as well. And if you want more information about all of the projects that I've done in the past and all the students who have been in those, uh, working on those projects, please check out that website. Um, yes, uh, now let me say a couple words about what we are planning on doing for Chem 400 research in the spring. It's a project, it's a called a course-based undergraduate research experience, also called a CURE or abbreviated to CURE. It's going to be using a handheld refractometer to measure the refractive indices of food solutions. And during this three lab period CURE, Chem 400 students will use the scientific method to develop a novel experiment, do background research, uh, calibrate and use a handheld refractometer, conduct a control experiment, then conduct their own experiment to graphically establish the relationship between two variables, and finally prepare a presentation, right? If you do research, you gotta tell people about it. Prepare a presentation about the results and record a video uh, that other students in the class will watch. How do we measure the refractive index of a solution? Well, I am nothing if not a one-trick pony, which means once I learn something, I put it in as many different projects as possible. And so we'll be using the same handheld refractometer that I talked about in the partial molar volume project. And I think, ah, uh, this is me taking a picture in the uh, eyepiece, which, and then I came across this on Instagram, this little video. Never back down, never what? Never give up. Never back down, never what? <laughs> anyway, I thought that was funny. It's a uh, video of somebody trying to take, a uh, of somebody video taking a video in a microscope, which I have so been there trying to take pictures and videos of the different um, handheld refractometer. And that is actually a picture I took from one of the experiments I did. Um, so anyway, let's see if it plays. Oh, good. And now that, that's the research for the Chem 484 and the Chem uh, uh, 400.
Tanya, do you want to take this one? Yeah. Hold on one sec. Okay. Yep. So um, in summary, from what I'm hoping you got out of this presentation is it research is really a great way to have a lot of problem solving experience, develop your critical thinking skills. There's a lot of different ways at SEC here to get involved in research. Again, classes, the Chemtech program, and uh, also your the, like the Chem 484 classes are you know great opportunities. And again, great research experiences. You get lots of mentoring and you know, we're very excited to do research here and we, you know, love working with students. So again, at the end of the day, it's just fun. It's and it's fun to be in the lab. And the acknowledgements here. So first of all, I do want to thank you, Bill. So Bill has thank been you, a Tanya. really big driving force for undergraduate research. It's really the truth. And um, you know, he's very supportive of this program. It's important or all of our different um, types of research. And we want to, of course, thank our college our education foundation, our dean and stockroom staff, lab manager, and all of our colleagues, right? And all of us here at Sac City um, really support being able to have undergraduate research. Many community colleges don't. So we're very lucky to be able to offer this to students. And thank you everyone for coming today. Yes, and um, we will be happy to take any questions if you have them. Um, looking at the um chat uh hopefully everybody's signed in i just reposted that and then um <laughs> uh, i don't know where that video came from but uh anyway it's probably hopefully it doesn't mean anything i don't mean it to um and uh for the one student uh, Bijou, <laughs> who uh, asked direct message me and says do you want us to submit our summary page today you can turn it in anytime within one week from today <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Go I was, was going to ask you about the, I'm sorry, uh, I probably missed that part about the class timing, uh, sorry, lab timing. Is it only Fridays? So the Chem 484 is Friday. The um, uh, Did you say when your Chem T 429 was? Friday as well. Friday in the afternoon. Um, Friday afternoon, yeah. So someone who can take the Friday lab, are you guys going to have another section or something you guys planning on doing later on? Maybe, possibly? I Not this semester for me, yeah. Because also it's difficult to have research in the week because it, it can conflict for my research, not for Dr. Miller's. <laughs> but that using the instruments, other classes use those instruments at that time. So it would be what time on Friday? So eight, so Chem 44 is 8.30 to 11.45 a.m. Yeah, and 4.29 is 1.30 to 4.40. Okay, thank you. Chase, you have a question? Yes, I was actually wondering if you could speak a little bit more on the REU programs you were speaking of. Uh, yes. Um, so REUs are, um, so, uh, and we should talk, um, we talk about this in the research group, actually, um, but REUs are, so you go there for eight to 12 weeks, depending upon the program. Um, I think the old Dominion program that we've placed students at before was 10 weeks on site in Virginia. So you actually physically go there. Um they realize that you're doing research with them, even though you are getting training as well. And uh, they pay you. Old Dominion in particular is very interested in community college students, um, and which a number of them are. And what we try and do is like, to be honest, Harvard's probably not taking any community college students, um, but a lot of them do. And actually sometimes uh, Harvard will have a specific community college emphasis and take students like you got to get into the details but but what you do is and what students have done is they go to old dominion they basically get training on an instrument similar to what tanya does here by the way um, and then they they get plugged into like they get a graduate student 
and they help the graduate student do their research pretty much. Um, and I don't know if that answers your question, Chase. I'm happy to talk more about it if, if I've missed some things. Yeah, no, that pretty much covers it. I was just kind of wondering what the benefits were to a program like that. And um, you, I see that Davis has opportunities. I don't think I'd want to go across the country, but <laughs> somewhere close to home would be nice. Yeah, no, these are full-time programs. Um, the Chem Energy one, which is in chemistry, is particular. Um, so the, if you're a chemistry major, um, we have a good relationship with them. And so we have placed students with them before, um, I think at least one. So yes, and there, there are local ones. Um, that's the main local place. I don't know if Sac State has any, but uh, we do try and place as many as we can, as close as we can. And if you're not a chemistry major, what are your odds of getting to a program like that? So the uh, you're better if the closer you are to your program, like you can see they have one in biologic have ones in biological sciences. So you, but I just don't know if they have one locally. The closest one locally that I could find that's more biology was the ecological and evolutionary response one. Um, but again, it, it depends. Biology is such a broad topic that it's, you know, may not be your part of biology either. But but what we do, Chase, and anybody who's interested is you express an interest, we hit those um, searches and we try and find places that are both interested in um, community college students and that you're interested in going to them. Another one, by the way, there's one up at um, Pacific Northwest Labs up in uh, Washington State that has been more open to the types of majors that it takes. So- um, I see there's a social behavior and economical economic science is one. I'll have to look and do some research on this on my own, I think. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, what's fun is it, it's, you know, if once, once you start doing research, like you'll find that there's a bunch of opportunities out there and it's just a matter hopefully of finding one that fits you that, um, and then we apply and we see how we do. Um, and if you're already in the research group, your recommendation is that much stronger when you apply for an REU, right? Because you've got, that is one thing they're looking for. And that's why we typically talk to our research students most. Oh, excuse me. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sure thing. Bill, there's a message from, a chat message from Alexis. Do you want to speak to that or? I can um, as well. Yeah, so I would say the, the main difference for me between 484 and 429 is that 484 has a lower bar for who can take it, I think. What do you think, Tanya? It does. So Chem T 429, really what it what it's for is to prepare students for industry. So you have to have a little bit more experience. You So right now in my 429, I have a student who's the, just taking the first organic. So if you've taken or if you're simultaneously taking organic, then it's it's going to be a good course for you. You have enough knowledge. Also, we accept, of course, the students who took quant. The 44, I have a student um, now who to speak to the that about the ecology, he's a geology major and he's doing the project here um, with me. And uh, so I think him 44 is better for that if he, you know, because he wants to transfer and, and to do an REU, in my opinion. Yeah, well, and my so what I would say, my opinion is if you can take Tanya's class, you get so much more actual chemistry experience. Yeah, no. Um mine is much more about doing research, introduction to research than and whereas Tanya's, I mean, what Tanya does could be done in first year graduate school. Like the instrumentation, the testing. Yeah. Um, so much better chemistry experience. 
no and well it's it's a different route right not not that it's better but if you're wanting to be a chem tech a lab technician you know they just want folks with that experience and i know dr miller teaches 484 like he's going to be the main instructor but if you're interested in a project i'm always happy to also take you on i won't be your official instructor but i could be helping lead that project so um in 484 again like i said it's um you can transfer those units and the prereqs for 429 is, uh, so uh, just be enrolled in organic or if you've taken quant. So I just need someone who's had at least a year worth of general chem experience for that level. Because it's much more independent. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay. But again, I also do the 484 level as well. So. Yeah, no, and that's like Tanya is teaching the 484 this semester, but I've got students that I'm working with. So we all share okay. that. So we share it. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? And hopefully, Alexis, we answered your question. Oh. Um, and oh, so we didn't answer about the ecology REU. Okay. Um, so what I would say, Alexis, is talk to me about you know, investigate it. Um, I mean, I just literally pulled up REU UC Davis and that one came up. So um, if it looks like something you're interested in, then I would suggest you do research uh, so that your application to the REU looks better. Yeah, more competitive. Right, because you're competing against UC Davis students. Uh, you know, the, the, the thing about these REUs is that you're competing with students really from all over the country because these are national programs. And so what we tend to do at Sac City is try and build relationships with the programs, with the people running them and send them great students so they know that they're getting great students from us, which we do, We say, which we have plenty of. Thank you. Bye -bye. See you tomorrow. Chase, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> so um, if I'm going to be doing research with you during spring, mm -hmm. what would my chances of getting into a social behavior REU be, although I'm doing chemistry research? So, um, well, so Chase, you and I have already talked about being on the social media project, right? <laughs> right? And so what will, what will, so it's not, I mean, it's chemistry related, but it's also like, maybe what we'll do is we'll actually look at the type of stuff that you want to do as far as behavioral stuff. Maybe we'll end up, part of your research project will be to make some social media and then actually do some focus groups with it. Okay, awesome. I don't know. Like, what, it's, you know <laughs> we'll, we'll figure it out, but that's, that's the great thing about this class is, and about research in general, is it can take so many directions. Okay, awesome. Looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. Uh, what if the class of 44 fills up? Um, that That is a good question. Um, we uh, What I can say is we try and accommodate as many students as possible. And... We will. I mean, I, so I don't know what the options are if it fills up, but we will do our best. That's all I can tell you for now, Candace. But get in early <laughs> if you can. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, and I guess I, I would just like to add to uh, Professor Ochoa's Chem 410 quantitative analysis class. He wasn't able to make it, but that has some good instrumentation in that um, course-based undergraduate research experience as well. So I'm sure Professor Ochoa would be happy to tell you about it. Well, excuse me. Hearing no other questions, let's wrap this thing up, Tanya. Thank you. Uh, one, uh, really enjoy working with you, Tanya. Yeah, uh, as well with you. And look forward to working, doing some research uh, on Fridays in the spring, right? Yep, yep, there we go. Awesome. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Yeah, thank you. Have a great night. All right, I'm going to stop recording now.